Our next panel will be a terrific conversation, uh, bringing some perspectives on fostering a diverse research workforce. And we're delighted to have a, a panel that joins us today that includes Dr. Marie Bernard, who is the Chief uh, Officer for Scientific Workforce Diversity at NIH, and LVG, who is the Executive Director for Global Inclusion and Diversity at Bristol Myers Squid. Uh, Dr. Jasmine George, a colleague of mine, who is the Research America's Dr. Lewis Sullivan Science Policy Fellow. And we're expecting Dr. Gary Puckran, uh, President and CEO of the National uh, Minority Quality Forum, to be joining us as well. And our moderator for the conversation will be Dr. Roy Wilson, who is President of Wayne State University and a Research America board member. So, Roy, I'm delighted to turn the program over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. <clears throat> you know, it just so happens that I'm at a um, retreat of the business leaders for Michigan. And this is uh, a group of about 80 to 100 of uh, the top business leaders in Michigan that have been meeting for a decade or so to try to make uh, Michigan one of the top 10 states in the country from, on economic matters. And uh, it's, it's very interesting because the topic for the last two days has all been about workforce talent, talent, talent. And essentially, that's what we're talking about here, except for we're talking about research talent, obviously, in the research workforce. But the, my point is, is that even in other uh, forms and in other sectors, uh, this is a very timely uh, subject right now, diversity in the uh, talent workforce, and specifically in this uh, case, in the research uh, workforce. So let's start at the top. And I'm going to ask uh, each of you a question and that, uh, and I'll start with uh, Gary in terms of answering and then go around the, um, the Hollywood squares here. So how, Gary, how do you envision the composition of the biomedical research workforce within, let's say, the next 20 years? You know, not so much what you hope to um, uh, change to be like, but you know, what, what do you think is uh, going to be the actual case with respect to uh, diversity in the research workforce in 20 years? Well, first, my, my apologies. I was uh, in another uh, application, so sorry to be late. Um, you know, so I would um, think very clearly about uh, the growing of uh, diversity of the American population. Right now, um, the population that we historically referred to as minority, or about 40% of the population, the majority of children under the age of 18 are minority. Um, so clearly, um, the workforce of the future um, is going to be much more diverse uh, than uh, it has been historically. And that poses real challenges. Um, for us because, um, you know, I mean, the numbers are pretty clear. We've not done a great job uh, in um, training um, the young in these communities uh, for um, the work that's ahead. Um, so um, it's going to pose real challenges uh, for the future, uh, particularly um, if um, it's going to be um, a, a diverse workforce. Uh, so I, I think that's the practical reality that um, uh, we we have you know changing demographics and uh, we need to figure out how to um, you know and I think down at the um, uh, at, at the elementary school level we've got to get them as young as we can um, and um, and think out of the box I think you know uh, I think we think traditional education pet, uh, programs uh, but I don't think that's going to work here. Um, I think uh, we have a community and here. I want to speak about the African American community. You know, I, I like to remind people um, that as late as 1965, African Americans couldn't go to a library. You know, um, and it's only 54 years uh, since since that. Um, so, um, so the tradition of of education and knowledge and the whole culture of learning uh, uh, needs to be thought through very carefully for these populations and. Um, I think we have to get very busy. So, um, Marie, uh, you know, it seems like Gary's uh, fairly optimistic that with the changing uh, demographics that that's going to be reflected in the in the workforce. Are you that optimistic or do you have any other thoughts as to how the workforce 
research workforce will be uh, in 20 years? Uh, I'm similarly optimistic because we already see when you look at who's in high school, who's in college, who's in graduate school, increasing diversity among those populations in 20 years out, those are the people who will end up being leaders in biomedical research, healthcare, et cetera. Um, clearly, the numbers are not representative of the general population, but the numbers are going up strongly. And there are programs that are being, more and more programs being put in place to facilitate people being on the pathway to success. STEM programs that are being put in place, uh, additional training programs that are being put in place, diversity supplements that are being put in place. And we can already see looking at NIH data that some of the disparities that have been uh, plaguing us in the past are lessening. Um, so if we continue in those trends 20 years from now, we should see a more diverse population of individuals in the biomedical sciences. And then you add to that, that we baby boomers 20 years from now will probably have retired. Um, and that takes out some of the homogeneity right there. Right. Elvie, you have any other thoughts or you agree? Uh, 100 percent agree, actually, on that. In fact, I think, you know, there uh, there is definitely an opportunity you know, at BMS, we're really committed to improving science, technology, engineering, and mathematics studies, right? And to really opening the young minds to the possibilities of STEM careers, right? And so um, we do recognize as well, and we see this in the research, a number of STEM graduates have actually grown, especially at the bachelor's and master's level. We know there's still work to be done. Uh, as uh, both Gary and um, Marie have, have, have mentioned, how you know Black, African American, and Latino and Hispanic talent remain underrepresented in the STEM workforce comparatively, um, and so you know we, being part of uh, that industry, know that we have uh, an ability to make an influence on that. So um, you know one of the things that EMS has been focusing on is on a program that really supports the advancement in STEM. Uh, and partnering very closely with historically Black colleges and universities as, as an example to really address this gap, right? And so we have a program called Tomorrow's Innovators. And what it does is it co-creates that custom biopharma programming so that there's a kind of two-way leadership exchange program in um, uh, when it co comes to exchange program for research purposes and for programming and, 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 and learning, actually. Um, and that really leads to an increase in talent recruitment for our HBCUs, um, also on making the connectivity with um, executive level black talent with our students of the future, as an example. Um, and then uh, another one we'll talk about, Gary mentioned about getting earlier, right, in, in, into the pipeline. I, I, I would totally agree with that. Uh, one of our um, uh, people business resource groups uh, is really partnering and it's our pan Asian one actually who's partnering with um, new city kids that's a nonprofit organization based in Jersey City in, in New Jersey that really empowers youth to break that generational poverty cycle right um, and so and, and what we've done is provided some scholarships to so far there's 22 students and mentoring opportunities for 15 of the graduate seniors so this is the way that um, honestly, uh, you know, large organizations can have a role and play a role in, in making a difference in the trajectory of, of um, our uh, STEM uh, careers for, for our students. Thank you, Alvi. So Jasmine, um, you're obviously um, more junior in your career or at a different stage of your career than most of the rest of us uh, on this panel. Uh, from your perspective, uh, do you agree with these uh, fairly optimistic uh, scenarios that's being painted by um, uh, the more experienced colleagues here? Or do you feel that um, progress is probably not going to be as opti as, uh, as um, forthcoming as it's been painted? Um, I actually do agree um, with LV. Um, Marie and Gary, in the sense that we are growing, and I've personally seen, you know, growth in the knowledge and um, participation and engagement of students who are my age and below um, in STEM. But I do think that 
there needs a lot of work to be done in supporting these students, supporting the retention of these students, um, and especially at the K through 12 er uh, area. Um, I know from my own experience and just uh, my experience going through uh, the educational, um, my, with my educational background, um, that it's very rare, um, and I'm not sure if you know, I'm incorrect in saying this, but it is very rare, and it was very rare for me to find opportunities um, in the K through 12 um, space. Uh, I relied a lot on uh, programs and um, things that were aimed at college students in order to get my perspective into research. And I feel that that could easily be a way to, or to start and to tackle, you know, the uh, diversity numbers that we have right now. Um, so, yes. Oh, thank you very much. Well, you know, I'm, um, I, I, I feel great that our panelists feel uh, optimistic. Um, uh, I guess I do also, but I will just say that in order to uh, reach those uh, projections of a more diverse uh, research workforce in the next 20 years, I, I do think that it's going to take really intentional work, and particularly at the leadership level, that um, we, we just have to do some, some really challenging, very intentional work to not only diversify the um, research workforce, but to diversify at all levels of the uh, research uh, workforce. So let me uh, move on then. And, and Gary, I'm, I'm going to um, ask you most of the questions uh, over the next um, 20 minutes or so, because I know you have a, a hard stop at 3 o'clock, and the rest of us can continue our discussion. So this is to you. Um, yeah, you've been working on improving equity throughout your career, <clears throat> and obviously from your answer to your uh, first, the first question, you think that there's been some progress uh, being made and you, you think there's going to be further progress. You know, what steps, what additional steps besides what we're already doing can we take to accelerate this progress? So if, if the question is related to, to equity in our healthcare system, so I always apologize by telling everyone my doctorate is actually in history. Um, so I always come at these things from a historical lens. Um, and I remind us that, you know, basically historians mark 1965 as a sort of breakwater point uh, where, uh, at least for the African American experience, um, uh, we left the segregated slave world and uh, African Americans uh, were able to move freely. Uh, uh, relatively speaking, we still see some backlash here and there uh, in the American uh, in the American marketplace, education, et cetera. Uh, but that legacy system in healthcare is still very much there. You know, um, the hospitals got desegregated in the 1970s. Uh, the American Medical Association really didn't desegregate uh, until the 1980s. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, uh, and so uh, I would think that legacy system needs to be reimagined uh, that it is uh, it was designed during a, an era when inequalities and equity both by law and by practice were permissible uh, and so um, no one um, shined the bright light um, certainly in the minority community they did and so on but um, the system um, you know worked as it was designed um, and now we're at a, a different moment and I think we have to go back and take a look uh, and make sure, uh, the way we look at it, it's about patient risk. Um, the healthcare has to be designed to mitigate patient risk. For every patient who comes through the door, uh, we want to lower their hospitalization rates, we want to lower their emergency room visits, we want to lower disabilities, we want to lower mortality. That's the work of healthcare. And everybody who comes through the door um, has to have access uh, to that. That's not the system that's built right now. Uh, and it's going to require a uh, dramatic dramatic change. Uh, this is not, this is a generational change. In the same way we're thinking about the workforce, uh, we have to think about uh, how we reimagine a uh, healthcare system to provide quality care for uh, a diverse America. So I think that's the challenge in front of us. Thank you, Gary. So um, Marie, um, you know, LV discussed some of um, BMS's 
uh, programs that they have. I, I feel very strongly that uh, this has got to be a partnership, a collaboration between both the private sector and the federal government. And I was privileged, of course, to work on the uh, work group on scientific workforce diversity with you um, before I got uh, kicked off with the uh, council, NIH council. Um, but one of the things that, that happened during my time there, which um, I, I think has been really significant, and I want to make sure everybody knows about it, is the UNITE initiative. Uh, can you tell us about the UNITE initiative um, and what other initiatives are there to increase workforce diversity from the NIH perspective and how are you evaluating the progress against goals? Thank you for the question. Yes, the NIH UNITE initiative is the big effort at NIH that's brought together all of the institutes and centers. We have 27 of them um, to really focus hard on enhancing diversity and equity. It was generated by what we saw at the start of the pandemic with disproportionate morbidity and mortality among communities of color. It was uh, accelerated by seeing the videotaped murder of George Floyd. And it led to us saying that we have to do something. Um, there are all of these issues that make it difficult for populations like African-Americans, Black, Hispanics, Latinos, American Indians, Alaska Natives to move forward and they're kind of built into the system. Uh, but we decided we were going to take it on um, to the degree that we can as the largest bundle of biomedical research. So through the summer of 2020, we worked on it. We um, uh, developed working groups uh, internally. And then February 26th of 2021, uh, officially unveiled the NIH UNITE Initiative uh, to end structural racism. Um, there are three content areas, health disparities, minority health research to address those disparities that we saw in health and recognizing that many researchers in that area are researchers from the first back, uh, focusing on our own internal workforce uh, where any inequities may be identified, recognizing that we need to role model what we expect of the external world, and then lots of focus on externally funded uh, biomedical workforce, um, things like um, providing uh, more funding for the Science Education Partnership Award Program that's K-12 STEM education. Things like um, giving extra money to uh, academic and research institutions to bring in groups of scientists uh, who are focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion um, and have a track record in that uh, and helping those young scientists become successful tenured faculty members. Things like um, providing, uh, developing a, doc, a prize recognition for uh, outstanding institutions in this space. Uh, things like providing extra money to scientists who are great mentors, particularly uh, considering uh, diversity issues. Uh, mentoring is not well compensated, and yet it's really important, uh, particularly for scientists who may not come with a built-in network to facilitate their moving forward. Um, so we're doing a lot of different things in a lot of different realms, um, research, internal workforce, external workforce, um, to move things forward. And from the, my viewpoint, that many who've been here at NIH for many, many years, longer than me, um, we're kind of turbocharging things in a way that hasn't been seen at the field at NIH. We think it's going to make a difference. Yeah. Thank you, Marie. I, I do think the UNITE initiative is, is really... Uh has potential to be transformational for NIH and broader. Um, you know, one of the, the things that I am aware of about the NIH is a concern for young scientists. And as um, we have uh, Jasmine here, who I would consider to be a, a young scholar. Um, and I'm just wondering, Jasmine, you know, what um, principal strugg struggles have you, have you faced and are facing and, and I wonder um, for the rest of you, if you think, you know, whatever her answer is that um, there's a generational difference or, or if we, you know, basically face the same things or, or, if, or if they're different. So Jasmine, you want to just kind of tell us about the struggles um, you're currently facing? Sure. Um, I would say the biggest struggle um, would be the improvements needing to be made to the existing pipeline. Um, as I've mentioned before, um, 
um, access to programming, especially um, that of STEM programming and ones that will get you into research are very rare at the K through 12 area. Um, and so enriching um, those resources for those uh, disadvantaged of populations, underserved minority populations um, could greatly improve uh, both access and enthusiasm um, that students have for science. Like I definitely see that increase, but I do think that um, having that early exposure is so important. Um, I will say, for instance, um, I uh, graduated from North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University, which is an HBCU, and I was a part of the pre-matriculation program um, at North Carolina A&T State University, which focused on recruiting high school students um, into uh, kind of like a pre-research program. Um, and unfortunately, that program does not exist anymore. And so the question I have here is what are some ways that we can enrich or even create restart programs that are aimed at students in, um, in high school, aimed at students in K through 12, so that they can see, one, that it is possible for them to be in the field and to belong in the STEM field, but also show them that, you know, um, this is an option, uh, you know. Um, and another, another thing that I would say um, is uh, also exposing them to a variety of STEM disciplines. Um, a discipline that I was familiar with was going into medical school, you know, becoming a medical doctor, but I was not uh, exposed to biomedical research and the important integration of many different bio biological um, components into one field like biomedical research until I was, I would say, my master's level. Um, so, so that could be something that can be used to improve, and that's something that we are currently fighting for, um, create, creating and sustaining these programs that are targeted as early as possible. And definitely partnerships as well, I would say, between um, industry and government could definitely make those a reality. So, so Gary, um, do you think that what Jasmine is, uh, has described is, is based the same thing as what previous generation of investigators uh, faced, or do you think there's some differences? Um, so as you suggest, I'm uh, part of an older generation, um, and um, my generation, um, uh, I, I was the first in my family to, to go to college. Um, uh, and quite honestly, uh, it was uh, it was during that civil rights era where doors opened up uh, that had been previously previously closed, and I got to graduate school because of the Ford Foundation. The Ford Foundation uh, had um, a, a fellowship program, and I think many in my generation uh, got to get doctorates and things like that uh, because of the intervention of the Ford Foundation. Uh, it was it was a very different world then. I think we you know we were coming out of a lot of uh, of, of social and evil, you know, it wasn't that far from Brown versus Board of Education, et cetera. I think this, I think this generation had really great opportunities. I think um, um, I think there's a real uh, commitment. I think the equity commitment is very, very real. Um, but I think you're right. It's going to take hard work. It's not not a given. It's not going to be easy. Um, but I also think that uh, we we have to be creative uh, and and not just um, do traditional things. And what do I mean by that? Um, so when my daughter was young, um, Howard University, which is an HBCU here in Washington, D.C., had a preschool program. So I could enroll her at the age of three years old, <laughs> think about that, um, in, in preschool at Howard University. And, and she had an opportunity to walk around the campus and uh, be connected to folks. In my mind, HBCUs could do a lot of that, um, not just educate um, uh, undergrads, uh, but they can open up their doors uh, to younger populations, particularly those who come from communities uh, where there's not that tradition of, of, of learning and education, et cetera. And that's what I mean about thinking out of the box. Um, it's not just being a traditional university, uh, but it's a university that's deeply tied to the community 
uh, and opening doors and figuring out creative ways uh, to bring young people in who might have otherwise gotten lost. I, I think that's the way I would uh, think about these problems. Alvi, you have any other uh, perspectives you want to uh, add to this? Uh, you know what, I 100% agree with everything that was said, uh, honestly, between uh, Jasmine and, and Gary. It is about adopting both a short-term and a longer-term view, right? When we talk about the short-term view, many organizations, including BMS, are really focusing on enabling the careers, you know, of, of students at that, um, you know, university, college, uh, postgraduate level. But we also have to keep um, um Ask, actually taking a look at how do we further see, you know, the pipeline earlier um, in, in there, right? And, and you know, one, uh, one of the ways that I know uh, the BMS has, has actually brought a program to that level, um, and, and Jasmine, you'll be uh, happy to hear this, it's, it's called a, a program called The Signs of Me. And it's, uh, it's in our local area, so we are, our headquarters are in New Jersey, right? And so it's a program at the Young Scholars Institute in Trenton, New Jersey. And it provides them classes actually to uh, the local area students in the third and sixth grade, right? So really what happens is students really attend this, it's, it's an eight week program, right? And we have the opportunity actually for them to participate in fun science experiments, right? And education games so that to peak their knowledge and to peak their interest in STEM careers so that they can consider that, right? And, and it's the gamut, it's not only about science, uh, we also, inject some of the JavaScript and, you know, coding, if you will, uh, into that so that they have the full gamut, if you will, of experiences from a STEM career perspective. So I agree. It has to be a both and approach. Yeah. I would just add that um, I do think there's some some fundamental differences uh, in Jasmine's uh, uh, current generational difficulties and, and what we, or at least in my generation, uh, encountered. And, and one of that is that... Um, in the past, at least when I was uh, uh, beginning my career, we were able to be more um, explicit about our intention with respect to affirmative action type programs. And I think that now it, it is, it's um, uh, with the climate and with affirmative action, I think that one has to find innovative ways to find proxies and other things and, and, and not be as explicit about what the uh, what you're trying to uh, trying to achieve, um, so that creates a you know some more difficulties I think. Um, so I think there are some some other quantitative uh, and qualitative differences. But this is a, a great uh, discussion. You know, one of the things that you know, since I mentioned affirmative action, uh, I'd be interested in both uh, Marie and Elvi. What challenges are you encountering in improving our workforce diversity, Marie? You know, you approach it from a, a federal um, a public standpoint, and and I'll be you from a, a, a um, more private standpoint. And as I mentioned earlier, I, I think there has to be collaboration between the two, and has to be a partnership between the two. And so I'd be interested in seeing, uh, hearing about you know what challenges from your perspective that you are um, uh, you know facing in improving workforce diversity. Um, so Marie, let's start with you. Yeah, I, I'm happy to address that. Because, and, and I just want to reinforce the prior discussion about starting at the K-12 level. We have good data that demonstrates that for many young people, science identity is formed by middle school. So those efforts to make outreach early are just invaluable. And what's being done by pharma, what's being done voluntarily by uh, academic organizations, what, uh, what's being done, NSF funding, NIH funding, whatever it takes. When you look at the people in the K-12 age categories, there's quite a bit of diversity there. So you don't even necessarily have to be saying you're doing a diversity program because there's quite a bit of diversity there. Relative to for specifically targeting diverse populations, yes, uh, by law, we cannot take into consideration demographic characteristics when we develop programs. Uh, we can develop programs and say that you know, this is a program where we particularly would like to have diverse perspectives. We have this new uh, funding opportunity announcement that actually allows reviewers to take into consideration diverse perspectives uh, among the scientific team. But when we say diverse, it's not just underrepresented racial and ethnic groups or women. It is diversity in discipline, diversity in geography, because we have good data that demonstrates that when you 
have that diversity involved in the scientific team, you end up with better outcomes, more creativity and innovation. Uh, and that is something that we are emphasizing more and more. Uh, we do have a notice of special interest in diversity that spells out what groups are seen to be underrepresented in science based upon National Science Foundation data, uh, based upon um, other sorts of economic data. So it's uh, women, individuals from underrepresented racial and ethnic groups, uh, individuals with disabilities, individuals who come from a disadvantaged background, and others. Um, those are just some examples when one's applying for a diversity supplement from NIH. But the issue of trying to bring together the diverse perspectives that are necessary for creativity and innovation has been a means of uh, allowing us to focus on diversity in lots of different settings. So, uh, Albia, I'm going to ask you to just hold for just one second because I want to get in a last question with Gary because it's almost three. And, and Gary, just in a, you know two sentences, what does success in achieving a diverse biomedical workforce look like for you? You know, I, I think for me, it, it means that um, every American has an opportunity to pursue a career uh, in biomedicine. Uh, and and, um, and, and the society is providing a helping hand in creating those opportunities. We're not guaranteeing anything to anyone, uh, but we're making sure that we're not shutting the door on someone prematurely uh, because we set up a system uh, that doesn't recognize it doesn't support uh, diversity. So that, that would be that would be success to me. Okay. Gary, I know you have to go. You're welcome to stay as long as um, you have to, but I, I wanted to make sure that I was respectful of your time. Uh, LV, you want to? Um, Appreciate it. Come on. Thank you very much, Gary, for your participation. Uh, L <clears throat> so, LV, back to you on uh, the question I asked about challenges that, um, that you're uh, facing in improving the uh, workforce diversity. Uh, absolutely. And, and I think it's not going to be different across um, any of our peer companies or actually uh, companies in other industries as well. I'm going to think back off of what Marie had talked about around, you know, what um, having different perspectives and, and, and basically inclusion, right, as a, uh, that enables innovation. Right, that does, uh, and 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 one hundred percent agree uh, with with, with Mariana on all the statistics she mentioned. The one additional thing I would add is that uh, psychologically safe environments where diverse first viewpoints are considered to help drive both those insights needed for innovation is critical. Right, uh, to enter into and, and, and to really allow allow the uh, the best uh, of our potential to thrive. Right. It, across all of the diverse communities that that, that we uh, embrace uh, into our workforce as well as that we serve. I would say, um, you know what, uh, organizations recognize that there is a need and you've probably seen an uptick in including BMS and in where there are commitments made around addressing inclusion, diversity and equity through workforce representation. Um, and, and so we as well have embraced that in 2020 as part of our efforts to really drive equitable advancement outcomes for all, that's exactly what we did. Um, and I'm happy to say that we are actually had made progress right, to really achieve our aspirational uh, representation goals um, at the executive levels of our organization. Recently, you'll re you can all read about it in our recently released 2021 uh, Global Inclusion and Diversity Transparency Report. Uh, with an update, we'll, we'll, we'll pop the link uh, in, in the chat box for everyone to take a look at that. Um, you can read in there how we've been able to make a you know, positive trajectory in terms of our three commitments around achieving gender parity at the executive level globally. Um, also by 2022, as well as doubling actually executive representation of Black and African American employees in the U.S. by 2022, uh, equally so for our Latino and Hispanic employees as well at that VP level in the U.S. Um, you know, we are tracking towards each of these goals. Uh, we still have a few months left, but yes, we are tracking towards these goals. And while this is really good progress, we also want to recognize and be realistic, right, that, that we need to continue to focus on, on this. Our commitments that we've made um, are meant to accelerate progress in these areas. And we will still need to continue to focus on the talent from diverse communities representing the patients we serve beyond 2022. It's not a short term play, we have to keep at it, right? Um, and, and, and so that's 
that's uh, what I would add actually to your question, Roy. So Jasmine, I'm going to ask you the next question, but before I do, I'm going to put um, Marie on the spot um, and follow up to her last uh, uh, answer. And that had to do, Marie, with um, you know your comment about having to start off younger and K through 12. And, and certainly, you know, others have mentioned the same thing, and I totally agree. Um, but but Maria, as, as you know, I, I've been on a lot of um, NIH committees and task force dealing with diversity. And every time we bring that topic up, the response is always, that's not NIH's job. We have we just deal with, you know, the, the post uh, K through 12, uh, particularly in the more more in the postgraduate in, uh, realm, um, which, you know, has been a little frustrating sometimes. So the question is. Should NIH change its stance on K through 12 if it really wants to make an impact on uh, workforce diversity? Yes, we do have a bit of a um, uh, uh, identity crisis when it comes to that because um, Congress uh, has sometimes brought, taken us to task uh, about K through 12 programs that really the remit of NIH is not really in the remit of the National Science Foundation. And yet we have uh, institutes within NIH, such as the National Institute of General Medical Sciences that legislatively has the obligation for this Science Education Partnership Award, which is a K-12 STEM program. So under UNITE, we have enhanced that program. We now have 17 institutes and centers that have signed on with NIGMS to be involved with that to markedly expand what's going on in those areas. Uh, the National Heart and Lung Blood Institute also has a legislative mandate to do that sort of outreach. But yes, the reality is that the majority of our focus is at the graduate level and beyond. Um, we think that partnering with National Science Foundation, Pharma, and others in that focus will bring more uh, trainees to that graduate level, where which is really the sweet spot for us, and we are adding lots of additional programs to smooth out that pathway uh, forward for those trainees. Uh, there's a, a diversity, what they're calling diversity R01s with several of the institutes and centers um, trying to encourage uh, a variety of scientists, particularly scientists from, uh, diverse, from underrepresented backgrounds to apply for R01 funding from NIH. They're, again, the diversity supplements, a great way to get a career started. But, and we're trying to encourage people to take advantage of them. Less than 5% of our old ones have a uh, diversity supplement associated with them. And yet, when you stand back and look at productivity of diversity supplement recipients, it's a great mechanism. If you want to hear more, we're doing a seminar on that November 17th in our Scientific Workforce Diversity Seminar Series. So, uh, yes, the reality okay. is other right. institutes have more of a space, have more activity in that area. Thank you, Marie. So Jasmine, um, to you. So as an uh, early uh, career researcher from a um, traditionally underrepresented um, background, um, what career advice do you wish you had received? And what advice would you give to those just starting off on their higher education path? Sure. Uh, that's an excellent question. I actually have a three-pronged uh, Jasmine's plan to success. Um, so the first prong is um, ask every question. So when you meet an early career scientist, a late career scientist, a fellow undergrad, a fellow um, uh, postdoc or, or graduate student, you want to really ask the questions how they got there, why do they want to do what they do? What's their motivation behind um, being in science? And so that'll help you inform like what movements you want to make with your career. So that's the first prong. The second prong would be to say, stay hungry. So don't hesitate to pursue every opportunity that you can either hear about or research, because the worst thing that can happen is that they say no. That's it. You know, you won't get the opportunity, but it's fine. You just pursue every single opportunity, um, no matter what you feel. Don't let uh, imposter syndrome stop you. Don't let the perceptions of where you have gone to for school, where you have, you have chosen to go for school stop you. Just do it. 
And my third part is you belong, right? So tell yourself at every step of the way, especially if you are in a field where you are the first or the only person there of, of, of your uh, kind, uh, to, to, to know that you belong there and that you are opening doors for others. So somebody will see you and say, oh, I, I recognize this person as being similar to me. And now I believe that I can be in this field. So knowing that you belong, asking every question and staying hungry are very key um, things that can take you from any uh, part of your career. I love it. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, excellent answer. You know, one of the things, and this is for both Maria and Elby, you know, we, um, uh, you know, all think that we we mentor uh, others and, and we try to. But, you know, mentorship actually is more complicated. It's uh, it's not something that you, know, you just make yourself available and talk to, you know, younger trainees and call it mentorship. Um, you know, there's a science to effective mentorship. So can you talk a little bit about um, how we can help diverse trainees advance in their careers and find the best possible career track for them? I mean, what are the you know, ways that we can become better mentors to help the early career uh, researchers succeed? I'll, I guess I'll start and I'll, you know, Elvie, you can add to this. And I think that we as mentors need to recognize that uh, we are not necessarily the one of only resource for our mentees and encourage our mentees to have a mentoring committee and to compare and contrast the information and the recommendations that are provided by the various members of that committee. Um, we need to really listen and understand what it is that the mentee wants and have a clear contract that individual as to what it is that you can provide and recognize when they've grown out of uh, the support that you can provide. And then we need to be in a position, and if we're not in a position, uh, connect our mentee with someone who is in the position to sponsor as well as mentor, to put that person forward so that they can be seen in important settings to advance their career. Um, so those are some things that come to mind right away. Uh, and we need to recognize that mentoring is usually not compensated, unfortunately. Some of the very best mentors out there uh, are individuals who had their own struggles, people come from underrepresented backgrounds. Um, and thus, again, we at NIH are looking to correct that. We've offered administrative supplements last year. We'll do it again fiscal year 23 to recognize excellence in mentoring. We're developing a competitive grant to recognize excellent mentors because it is very important for those individuals who don't come with their own built-in networks to help them to the floor. LB, what would you want to add to that? Um, I think those are great, uh, Marie. Uh, solid points, actually, from a mentoring standpoint. Uh, what I would add with to that is that um, there is mentoring that exists from a technical skill standpoint, right? If you think about a career, right, in STEM, um, and 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 there is mentoring there, right? When you're talking about uh, what you know, if you're talking at the college, uh, junior or senior level, if you're talking at high school level, that's where the mentoring probably is focused more around learning about the drug development process and specific parts of the pharma industry, right, and job seeking, basic job seeking skills. But as you get closer and closer to getting to uh, seeking out uh, your uh, your next uh, career, if you will, um, I think you know one of the things that, and from a private sector standpoint, that um, is the fundamental content of, of of mentoring happens is around navigating the organizations, right? When you're working for uh, the uh, pharmaceutical bio uh, biotech industry, right? Well, how how are you navigating through that maze, right? It, it, it's it's huge. Um, and these are the skills that you are not necessarily learning in academia, right? Um, and, and so this is where it becomes critical on how to do that, number one. Number two, I would say one has to approach mentoring, uh, I would say, um, not only from seeing a mentor being a seasoned professional, but take a look and make sure that you also have peer mentors as well. Because guess what? Those who have been at your level have actually also walked your path and may have learnings to share, such as Jasmine just did, right? And so uh, reach out to, to, to your peer level. 
I think the last thing, the third thing I would say around mentoring is it's reciprocal. So it's it's not a one way exchange, right? And so make sure that while you are asking for advice and 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 feedback and input from your mentor, that you find a way to give back as well, because that will go a very long way to Marie's point on how you can cultivate that mentoring relationship to go from a, being a mentoring to a sponsorship. When you're sponsored, right? What happens is um, people are advocating for you when you're not in the room. That's what sponsorship and that's what good looks like. So be, with, I want to pass so, it to Roy. <laughs> yeah. So we have one minute left and I'm going to ask all of you the question I asked uh, Gary before he left. And we'll start with uh, Jasmine, then Elvi, then Marie. So what will um, success and, and achievement of diverse biomedical workforce look like for you? And, and please, in less than 45 seconds each. <laughs> Okay, um, I will say quickly that success for me will look like transparency, so knowing who is there and how we can improve. Um, it would look like collaboration, so seeing those collaborations between um, government agencies, industry, um, etc. And then finally, persistence. This is going to be a conversation that we are going to have every single day forever. So having that persistent, having DEI, DEIA at the front of our, our, our goals, missions, et cetera, at all times will spell success to me. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you very much for being a part of this. You added so much. Um, Evie. Um, I would say that was well said. The only thing I would say is, uh, listen, uh, what good will look like is if um, all of industry and not only uh, healthcare industry, right, all of industry in the STEM fields come together to ensure that we are enabling everyone to thrive and bring their best self forward. That's that's what good will look like for me. Thank you. So, Marie, take us home. Of course, I have to bring the NIH perspective. And um, success would be when we get to the point that you cannot predict based upon a person's demographic characteristics, the likelihood of their success in being an NIH-funded investigator. And you cannot predict, based upon their uh, demographic characteristics, what position they have in the professoriate. Okay. Well, we're at our appointed time for concluding. I, I want to uh, thank the uh, panelists. Um, you were all great. I want to thank everyone who's uh, listening 